Okay, so we had left off. Yeah, we hadn't. We had gotten to the kind of the core of, of four through six, where it talks about he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Um, but we hadn't really gotten uh, too much in depth of uh, the rest of Isaiah 53, really kind of the second uh, second half. And uh, by the way, if somebody had said uh, to you, you know, some um, maybe a Jewish person who, who understands Isaiah 53, maybe somebody else uh, said that Isaiah 53 is not about the Messiah, it's, it's describing Israel. What would be... How would you respond to that, maybe? How would you respond and say, well, from the text itself, you know, what, what might you argue to show that this is actually a messianic uh, text? You can argue lots of things, but I want us to be able to understand it from, uh, from Isaiah's writing. What are indications that this is an individual, the Messiah, not just um, uh, some uh, representative like Israel? Yeah, uh, Vivian and Patrick. Uh, verse 5, it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds are we are healed. That, like, can't be a nation, really, and it's not accurate to Israel. Okay, those two important arguments. It, 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 it seems to have a singularity there. Now, sometimes Israel is called a he, but, but yeah, he's doing this on behalf of someone else, on behalf of Israel. So that's, that's important to realize that he, the, this one is, Israel is called God's servant, but this servant acts to bring Israel back to God, right? So we've, we've talked about that. Um, and then also... Um, they say that this didn't, you know, that you brought up that this didn't happen to Israel. Israel, the Jews have been through some really bad things, right? The Holocaust, this other stuff. But they haven't died and come back from the dead, right? So there isn't that really, um, maybe you could argue that in a sense, but um, that would, I think, would be a stretch. Yeah, Patrick, what were you going to say? Uh it said he had no form of majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. And so it's kind of characterizing a human who didn't really have anything that made him stand out, which is accurate to New Testament representations of Jesus. Okay, yeah, that's true. So yeah, it does coincide with New Testament ref representations of Jesus. Now they would just say that, hey, look, you know, Israel, the Israel is rejected, despised, looked down on, you know. So... Um, but that's true. Yes, there is, you know, that uh, correspondence where you read it and you say, okay, well, that does sound like it's describing an individual, right? So, um, okay. Any other things? Somebody said this is about Israel. It's not about the Messiah. And it's definitely not about Jesus of Nazareth. Um, any other ones that you guys would kind of maybe use to answer this? Yeah, I think those, I mean, kind of get at it from, at least from the text, you can understand and say, okay, well, look, this guy's acting on behalf of Israel, you know, as God's servant. Israel's God's servant, but they don't do the job. This guy is acting to bring Israel back to God, as Isaiah 49 talks about, uh, and he dies and comes back, right? Okay, um, we left off just a little bit talking about uh, verses 7 through 9. Um, and then I'll just remind us that just at the end of uh, really verse 8, it talks about that no one really of, of his generation considered that this individual was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Cut off means to, to die, but it's also a very severe word that means a... Um, it means to die in a way that you are, are separated. Okay, so uh, it's a cut off from the transgression, uh, but it wasn't for his own sins, it's for the people's sins, for the transgression of my people. So, right, so this can't be just Israel because this one is cut off for the transgressions of my people, who is Israel, right? So, um, anyway, it, so it, it, it talks about the Messiah being pierced, being cut off, being struck. But the big turnaround, the point of Isaiah uh, 53, is that he's dying. He looks like he's being smitten uh, by God under the, the strokes of, of men, which is the discipline that God would bring on the kings. Um, but the kind of 
important point is he's suffering for sin, but he's not suffering for his own sin. He's suffering for what? Ours. He's suffering for our sin, right? So that's the um, important kind of uh, piece that Isaiah adds in is that he's suffering in our place. This is what accomplishes salvation, accomplishes that fellowship with God, allows sinful people to be forgiven uh, and to be holy and to dwell with um, a holy God, right? So um, and it goes on in Isaiah. Uh, can somebody read Isaiah 53.10? We see here uh, real, really two important uh, points. Yeah, Eli. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he... He would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Okay, so it talks about here that the the judgment that is on this servant, it's not for his own sins. He's pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. But the one facilitating and overseeing that that judgment is, is God. God is... Uh, pouring out his wrath, Isaiah 53.10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. Uh, so it's not just that the Romans killed Jesus, it's that God uh, is pouring out his wrath uh, against Christ. Christ is also participating in this act um, as he, uh, what does it say he does, in I, that, uh, that Christ does, the Messiah does in Isaiah 53.10? That the Lord would crush him if he would do what in return? God's not just crushing him because he doesn't like him or he's not crushing him for fun. He's crushing him because the Messiah is doing something um, that goes along with God's crushing him. Taking away sin? Taking the blame? Read, read what it says. Yes, that's true. But read what it says in Isaiah 53.10. What does the Messiah do? Yeah. And his soul makes an offering for guilt. Okay, makes an offering for guilt. It's that he he offers himself, okay, if he would, uh, okay, so offers himself as a particular type of offering, a guilt offering. Okay, this is in Isaiah 53.10. Um, a guilt offering is a category of offering in the law, in Leviticus, that means you, you pay for your sin against God. You, that's what the offering is for, is to atone for your sin against God and to pay for the consequences of your sin. Okay, so um, now we see there's a... Uh, well, well, by the way, who offers the guilt offerings? Who offer in general, in the law? The the, the priests, yep. Yeah. So this is a uh, another uh, priestly act. But now there is a... Um, he has to be a different type of priest because he's a king and a priest. And we see that there's a, uh, a new uh, system with this kind of uh, final sacrifice that actually takes away sin completely. Okay, um, because he he doesn't offer uh, animals. He offers what? Himself. He offers himself. Yeah, and so that's the big changeover. Is now there is the um, the righteous worshiper, the righteous offerer, the only person to offer a sacrifice for sin that actually never sinned. Right. So the righteous offerer and worshiper. plus uh, the, the right sacrifice, one that can actually take away uh, sin. Okay, or let's, let's put here the uh, effective uh, sacrifice. Because the sacrifice is the law. You're, you have relationship with God, but the sacrifices go on and on and on. You can't offer animals for human sin. It's not... It's, God doesn't accept that really as valid, and there's not offerings for everything. For example, David committed murder, adultery, conspiracy, all sorts of things. And David says, if there was an offering, I would give it. But the I don't have an offering according to the law that, that's appropriate to the sin I've committed, but I'm still asking for God's forgiveness. Well, 
now uh, Jesus is the one that puts these uh, these ideas together, right? And if you want to read uh, about this, uh, you can read in Hebrews uh, 10 uh, that talks about <coughs> Jesus offers the, the once for all sacrifice according to the will of God um, because he is the one who delights to do God's will from the heart unlike anybody else. So uh, he offers himself as a guilt offering. Now there's something that we need uh, to to see here uh, taking place. Okay, so we see um, we see that the uh, servant is crushed. We see he offers uh, himself. Okay, and this is talks about death. Okay. And then we also see, uh, what else do we read next in Isaiah 53, 10? Uh, yeah, Patrick. Uh, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Okay, see offspring, okay, basically the results of what he's done. Uh, God is going to prolong his days, which we've read about, right, that, that <clears throat> he will... Uh, rule over the throne of his father David forever. And then what is the next part? You will see his offspring is, uh, and the good pleasure of the Lord will uh, prosper through his hand. So uh, we'll just put, you know, victory, uh, reign. Okay. So what's kind of the funny thing about this, you know, odd thing about this in Isaiah 53 10? You have at one point, um, it's talking about God's crushing him. He's offering himself as a guilt offering. And then he's going to reign. He's going to have victory. The good pleasure of the Lord is going to prosper through his hand. What's, what's happening there? I mean, why is that kind of odd to say those things next to each other? Yeah, they you know they don't seem to be going together, right? So we get this that the servant is going to be high and exalted and have victory. That it's going to somehow come through this suffering. So what has to happen in between? Let's in, it doesn't spell it out, but in Isaiah fifty three ten, there's like a switch that happens there. What what does this mean? There needs to happen in between um, Messiah's suffering and death and his, uh, his reign. Resurrection. Resurrection, yeah. And so there's the necessity, even though it doesn't say, and he rose from the dead, it says the Messiah is dying, God crushes him, and then he rules over the, the nations. Uh, uh, Psalm 22 does the same thing. It talks about, I'm dying, I'm hung up on the, the horns of a wild ox, they pierce my hands and feet, I can count all my bones, they're all out of joint. It feels like God has forsaken me. Gentiles surround me. And then he says, and then um, I know that God's not far from me. I will uh, sing of God's name uh, in my brethren, uh, among my brethren, and all the world will turn to God through me. Right? So there's this changeover uh, that, that basically uh, necessitates that there has to be a resurrection. Okay, so, um, so that the Messiah is going to have victory uh, as well. Now, a lot of people didn't understand when Jesus came. They're like, okay, we're going to have the Messiah's reign and his victory, and he's going to be king. But then when Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified, you know, they're like, well, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense because they're not putting together all the pieces until they see uh, Jesus actually die and rise from the dead, right? So they thought, are there multiple messiahs? Are there, you know, there are there different messiahs? But it's different timing of what um, what Jesus is accomplishing. That's why he makes clear in a, a passage that I believe alludes to Isaiah uh, fifty three, Matthew twenty twenty eight, Mark ten uh, twenty uh, forty five is Jesus talks about that um, they're, they're arguing about who's the, going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus says something to them that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, in fact, can somebody read Daniel 7.14? Can somebody read Daniel 7.14?
Yeah, Bryn? And to him was given to me glory and kingdom, that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Okay, so in Isaiah, uh, in Daniel, Daniel has a vision of this one like a son of man coming and uh, on the clouds and appearing before God. And then God gives him the kingdom of the whole world and he rules over the whole world. And what does it say all the nations will come and do uh, to him in, in Daniel 7.14? All the nations, yeah, Bryn? Would serve him. So it's confusing for the um, disciples when Jesus says, the Son of Man did not come to be served. It's like, well, wait a second, Jesus. It says in Daniel that the Son of Man is going to come and all the nations are going to serve him. But Jesus says in Matthew 20, 28, and Mark 10, 45, that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? Serve, to act as God's servant. And then how is he going to do that? It's not just by being nice. I, I came not to uh, be served, but to serve and to give what? You guys know this verse? His life is a for many. To give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus is laying out for the disciples, my mission is to accomplish the kingdom of God, where all the nations are going to turn and serve him and worship him, <clears throat> is I need to do God's work as the servant and give my life a ransom for many. That has to come uh, first before I, uh, before I reign, before I have the, my victory. That, that's the path to victory is actually going to be through suffering. So that's why they didn't really understand. And, and also why Jesus is not really understood today as, um, as the Messiah, because they're like, well, didn't he just die as a crucified criminal? I, he may have been a nice guy. Um, but uh, or a false messiah, but he didn't um, he didn't really reign like God said he would. So that's what their their point of confusion um, was. Even even people who believed in him, like the disciples, they're like we're, we seem to be missing you know these big parts of the Old Testament that talks about his reign because they're not understanding Jesus has to uh, die first. Um, okay, uh, can somebody read Isaiah fifty three eleven? Fifty-three, eleven. Uh, yeah, Vivian. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Okay, so uh, the we have here some important terms and concepts. Okay, so we have justification. Okay, in Isaiah fifty-three, uh, eleven, Vivian's uh, version. Uh, what do you have? ESV. ESV. Okay. Uh, that's pretty good. Had, had, will, he will make many to be accounted righteous. That's a good way of saying it. Um, in the New American Standard, it, it says he will justify the many, right? So this is this idea of justification that uh, Jesus is able to be righteous in someone's place, and then his righteousness is able to be counted for uh, an, an individual in their place, right? So as he's able to bear their sins, um, this also uh, gets at the idea of, um, in the New Testament, what's called imputation. Romans 4 is all about this, that God doesn't look at us and say, wow, you lived a righteous life. He actually gives us the credit of Jesus' righteousness. Okay, so that's, that's what's going on uh, here. That it's like when God looked at Abraham, Abraham believed God, God credited it to him as righteousness. Um, David sinned, God, David prayed in Psalm 32, too, do not count this sin against me, right? That's what's uh, being accomplished here. David knew that he uh, deserved to die for his sin, but knows he's forgiven. Now we see how that would take place because uh, Christ. Uh, died in a sacrifice that actually justifies, that actually saves once for all. This is what makes us, uh, this is what distinguishes us in our school and our churches uh, from uh, Roman Catholicism, the, the gospel of Roman Catholicism. I have Roman Catholic uh, friends, but the, the gospel of Roman Catholicism does not have a place for uh, imputation, even though it's one of the most important concepts in the Bible. Um, for what happened when Jesus died for our sins. 
they believe that Jesus did something for us that we could never have done for ourselves, and that was very gracious. But in doing that, God has poured Jesus' righteousness into us, and then we are to take that, live out a righteous life of God, of faith and works, and that that is what pleases God. What the Bible teaches is that it is not on the basis of our works, even though God does change our lives and give us a new heart, it is on the basis of Jesus' righteousness counted uh, to our account and our sins counted to, uh, to him, okay, is what uh, this imputation is. It's an exchange of our <clears throat> sin for his righteousness, where we get the credit and Jesus gets uh, the blame. Okay, so that's, that's a big um, difference. Um, but not that many people are actually that clear on that difference, and I think we need to be uh, very clear on what that, what's actually going on uh, there when Jesus saves. Because a lot of Christians, I think, think that Jesus comes in, changes your life, and then you live a life that's pleasing to God, and that's the, why God accepts you. Um, and it's not. God accepts you because of what he already accomplished in Christ, um, and then changes your heart, changes your life. Uh, as a result of those things. Does that make sense, that difference? Okay, because um, that's kind of, that's, that's a big um, dividing line, really, of the gospel between us and, uh, and Roman Catholicism, which they would believe in Jesus. They know Jesus is God. They believe in the Trinity. They believe the Bible is inspired. Uh, but they, we have a different view of uh, what the gospel actually is. Um, and I think that's for a good reason, because I think this is what is being taught from the Bible itself, even from the Old Testament. Um, the other thing that's important to see from this, from places like Isaiah 53, um, is that Paul didn't make this stuff up. When he talks about Romans and Galatians, Romans 1 through 4, um, really the whole book of Galatians, he's not just pulling in these ideas on his own. He's taking them from, uh, from the Bible, and he's saying, okay, here's what Jesus did. Here's the Old Testament that helps me understand the significance of what uh, what Jesus did. Okay, um, okay Isaiah fifty three twelve. It says uh, God talks about the Messiah's victory further and says, "I will uh, allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the spoil with the strong, uh, because he poured out himself to death." Right. So he's obviously resurrected. Uh, and was numbered among transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for transgressors. So we see again uh, this intercession. He's acting as a priest. We saw he sprinkles the nations. He offers himself as a guilt offering. He intercedes. So we see that the the Messiah, the Davidic king, uh, would also be a priest to offer a final sacrifice for a new, uh, new system. Okay, so uh, Isaiah 53 um, makes those things uh, fairly uh, clear of what the work of Christ actually um, entailed. Okay? And then obviously Isaiah 53 uh, gets quoted a lot in the New Testament. We make reference to uh, these two scriptures, uh, Matthew 20, 28, Mark 10, 45. We've talked about Philippians 2, 5 through 11, it talks about Jesus' uh, humility as acting as God's servant, uh, obeying to the point of death, and that God exalts him, the exaltation of God's servant. And then he quotes Isaiah 45 to talk about Jesus being exalted uh, with a name that is above every name, right? And then uh, can somebody read 1 Peter 2, 24? Yeah, Patrick. <clears throat> Shut up. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Okay, so Peter, who obviously knew Jesus, saw him die and resurrected, puts his explanation of Jesus' death and resurrection in the language of Isaiah 53, right? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And I appreciate uh, that, that the translation, Patrick, were you reading New American Standard? Uh, ESV. Oh, ESV, okay. 
Um, good. Well, I mean, I appreciated that it used the word tree um, because sometimes it says cross in translating First Peter two twenty four, and that's fine. Um, but Peter is also thinking about tree in uh, the language of the Old Testament. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So he's he's using the word tree, I believe, on purpose um, to to emphasize that Jesus. Uh, takes on the curse for us. So he bears our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to uh, righteousness, right? So uh, Peter, he was there on the ground, knew Jesus, but he takes the Old Testament and helps him explain what Jesus' death actually meant, what it was about, okay? So, um, all right, now just moving on, there's... um, a song of uh, joy, basically, in Isaiah 54, okay, talking about because of the victory um, of the servant, you know, the, the results that will take place for Israel. Um, just something, by the way, just to be aware of, um, I've talked about the, the Catholics uh, and I'll mention here an Eastern Orthodox guy I knew. Um, it talks about here that uh, Zion, Israel, it says because of this work accomplished in Isaiah 53, they're going to shout for joy. They're going to be like a barren woman who didn't have children but now does. Um, I knew an Eastern Orthodox guy who said that this uh, basically used passages from Isaiah 54 to say that Mary had a painless childbirth when she gave birth to Jesus. And I'm like, I see what you're saying, but the, that text isn't even talking about Mary. You know, So you, you have to be aware of a lot of times people will draw um, ideas or doctrines from wording of a text without knowing what the text is actually um, talking about. Okay, So that's why it's very important to understand uh, the context of the books, because if somebody says, well, yeah, Isaiah 54 teaches Mary had a chi- uh, painless childbirth and that she was sinless throughout her whole life, is what he also said, um, you know, it would be helpful to know, well, Isaiah 54 isn't even about Mary. It's about Israel. It talks about Sarah uh, in the Old Testament, but it doesn't talk about uh, it doesn't talk about Mary in Isaiah 54. So uh, just be aware that it's important to take the Bible for what it says in context, not just take wording and say, okay, well, the, the word said, you know, this combination of things, therefore I will teach, you know, this uh, idea. Uh, Macy, did you have a question or something? Oh, can I go to Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, God announces uh, the freedom of his... Uh, Offer of mercy in Isaiah 55 uh, talks about coming and, and buying uh, woo, uh, food and uh, water uh, for free and uh, without cost, right? So he talks about that the uh, grace of salvation that he says you can have abundance uh, without, uh, without providing uh, anything. But then he calls them... Uh, to repentance because of this, okay? Let me read one of the greatest um, statements of, uh, of repentance, kind of defining what repentance uh, is, is thought of in the Old Testament, and that's in Isaiah 55, uh, 6 uh, through, through 9, really. It's this, um, and it also has a passage in here that we, we misunderstand sometimes, okay? So, Isaiah, this is how he, God through Isaiah, puts repentance. He says, seek Yahweh while he may be found. Okay, so it's this idea of turning, seeking God. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. And he will comp- have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Right? So this is a, you know, Good news verse talks about seek the Lord, call upon him. But it says, let the um, wicked man forsake his ways and let the unrighteous man forsake his what? Isaiah 55 verse 7. Because I want to point out something in the next verse. His thoughts? His thoughts, yeah. So... You guys have heard this phrase before where people say, well, God has said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, right? You guys have heard this before? 
right? If people said that. Um, that's where it's like, you know, people put that like on a pillow or like a, like a sign that you have in your house, you know, or something like that. And what they usually are talking about when they use this verse is they're saying God's, God knows more than us, so we should just trust him even when we don't know everything. That's true, but that's not what this verse is talking about. Listen to, to Isaiah 55, 8. It says, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Okay. Well, God just told us to turn away from our sinful thoughts, forsake our sinful ways. So God is saying... My thoughts are not your thoughts, but they should be. You should be thinking like I do. My ways are not your ways, but they should be. Therefore, you need to uh, repent. So what God is actually saying here when he says your thoughts are not my thoughts, your ways are not my ways, is saying your thoughts and your actions don't match up with my character. Therefore, you need to repent. So that's what God is getting at here. Um, Isaiah 55 also talks about, has that statement of God's word not returning uh, void. It always accomplishes the exact purpose God uh, sets it out to do. Um, Cool connection. We don't have time to develop it, but Isaiah 56, um, because of the work, the saving work of the servant, even people who uh, would be by the law considered unclean, And because of the results of just being in a sinful world, even things that weren't their fault, if you had a defect or a handicap or something that happened to you, like if you were made a eunuch, meaning you had um, basically a mutilation uh, of your body so that you couldn't reproduce uh, children, uh, which is very common back then if you worked in a a king's uh, court and you were around uh, women or something like that. They wanted to make sure that only the king's uh, they knew that the king was the father of all the children, so the men would, it would basically be uh, castrated. But if you were a eunuch, you, you couldn't go into the temple. You couldn't go into the tabernacle. You're on the outside. You could sacrifice, you could pray, you could believe in God, but you're still kind of on the outside. When Isaiah 56, it talks about these people, even eunuchs, are now included and can come to God. Those, they've now been made clean. Um, In in Acts 8, you guys remember that this guy is reading a scroll of Isaiah on a chariot and uh, Philip goes up and shares, and he's reading Isaiah 53 and Philip talks about him, uh, about Jesus from Isaiah 53, okay? That guy was a eunuch. He worked for uh, a queen named, uh, well, named her title was Candace down in the south. And he was a Jew or a Jewish convert who had an Isaiah scroll, which is very rare. And he is now, Philip tells him that Isaiah 53 is pointing to Jesus, okay? And he believes and is baptized. If he continues reading, he would have gotten to Isaiah 56 that talks about even the eunuch who calls on my name is now, uh, is now brought in. Uh, in salvation has now been made clean because what the law was pointing to um, has now been fulfilled in Christ. So, um, so that's a kind of a connection. Acts 8 is emphasizing that uh, because Jesus is the suffering servant, all these consequences of what Isaiah talked about are now unfolding uh, throughout the world. Okay, that's also the gospel going to the Gentiles. Um, Isaiah 57, uh, there's another rebuke of evil uh, leadership. Okay. And God rebukes the people in Isaiah 58 for their superficiality. They, can, they fast, they stop eating, and they ask God for help, but they continue to sin as they're doing these things. Okay. So um, then Isaiah 59 is the armor of God passage, okay. um, where God talks about your sins have made a separation between you and me. Okay. And God says, but I, I can save um, in... Ephesians and other passages, who wears the armor of God? Who's supposed to wear the armor of God in the New Testament? Well, what does Paul say with the armor of God? He says, yeah, put on the armor of God, right? So we're supposed to wear it. But I think we think it's just for us. Isaiah 59 makes clear God says, I will put on salvation. I will put on the belt of truth. I will put on the the shoes of peace and I will come in victory as a warrior and save you. What Paul is talking about with the armor of God is he's using Isaiah to talk about that because 
Jesus has put on the armor of God, he's come and saved, that we now put on the armor of God because we're in him. We have that salvation uh, protecting us, right? That is that has saved us. Um, okay, last couple of things here, guys. So uh, in Isaiah 60, um, there's the uh, announcement of good news, Zion. Uh, Israel gets glorified, okay? In Isaiah 61, Jesus reads this in Luke 4. It talks about... It, verse 1, the spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me. Notice that me is going to be important. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news, the gospel, to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, and to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Jesus reads those two verses in his hometown when they're all happy to see him, and he's going to sit down to teach, and he says, uh, today these scriptures have been fulfilled in your hearing, because he says, now I'm, I am this person, I'm here, and they don't accept that. And then Jesus says, well, wait a second. Look, in the Old Testament, they rejected the prophets and then went and healed Gentiles. There were plenty of people who could have been healed in Israel, but they didn't listen. Right? And he says, you're just like them. And Jesus gets uh, kicked out of his, they chase him out of his own uh, hometown. Okay? Isaiah uh, 62 talks about God uh, giving Zion a new name, giving them glory. Isaiah 63, God's judgment of uh, the nations. Um, Isaiah 64 is, his, is a prayer of uh, asking God for help and has a great statement in Isaiah 64, 6 where it talks about all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before God. Everything that we do, even when we're at our best, is, uh, is not acceptable to God except in, uh, in Christ. So everything that we think we're good uh, is, you know, is not really good enough. Okay, and I use that verse a lot with people who uh, believe in works righteousness. That the best we think we offer is offensive uh, to God if it's outside of uh, outside of the work of Christ. So God uh, talks about in Isaiah 65. His he, there's some judgment, but then He also talks about He's so serious about His plan that He will create a new heavens and a new earth. He will work. In Isaiah 65, 17, it says, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be uh, remembered or come to mind. So God will act. He's so serious about his plan that he's going to make everything uh, new. And then what does God want? In Isaiah 66, verse 1, it says, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where then is the house you could build for me? Where is the place that I may rest? Uh, for my hand made all these things, thus all these things came into being, declares to the Lord. But to this one I will look, to the one who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. So he says, the one I'm, I'm focused on is the one who listens to me, trembles at my word, is humble and has a repentant heart. That's the one that God focuses on. But the last verse of Isaiah, and I'll just quit here with this, is, uh, is a wor warning about while there is salvation and eternal blessing, there is also a warning about eternal uh, judgment. There's a passage about hell that Jesus quotes from Isaiah 66, uh, 24. He says, while the people are going into the new creation, there is also going to be an eternal judgment it says in Isaiah 66, 24, this last verse of the book, it says, Then they will go and uh, forth and look on the corpses of men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. Right? So it talks about that there is an eternal judgment, uh, just as there is an eternal salvation. So Isaiah is saying, be humble, repent, tremble at God's word, and turn to uh, turn to the suffering servant and accept his work. So anyway, okay, we're done with Isaiah.